Why has your loss of fear bothered you? Every time I'm about to do something dangerous, and that's say to get in the water, not even dangerous, but unknown, and you're about to get in the water with a thousand pound predator, or a thousand pound grizzly bear walks up to you, and everything in your body, your gut, you know, your instincts are saying, this is bad, you're gonna die. And through what I do with my work is you've learned to ignore these things. When I take off in a storm in my ultralight or in bad weather and I'm pushing, pushing myself to go get these images, your body's saying, don't do this. And I've called that the gray area. And I would just say that that fine line of what's gonna kill you and what isn't has turned into this big, muddy gray area for me. And so that's where, that's what I'm scared of right now that I'm like, I've done all these other things where my, my stomach has told me that I'm gonna die if I do this, and you lived. And so now you just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. So now I'm at a point where I think I've pushed the limits of, of, of death or the limits of, of um, what's possible and what isn't. And, and I'm at the point now where I, I'm starting to listen to my gut a little more. You know, I don't want You are. To, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm definitely slowing down in the sense that I won't push myself to 220 feet on a dive. If it's, I mean, I'm watching my friends die around. My friend Rob Stewart just died on a rebreather. He was a guy who was gonna save the world and he was gonna live forever. And when your friends around you die, you know, I was working in the Canadian Arctic a few years ago and uh, working with a close friend of mine on our snowmobiles and we fell through the ice a couple times and we were able to get ourselves out and it was almost fun and adventurous. And then I went back uh, home and two days later I get a call that he went through the ice on a snowmobile and died. And you're just like, it's, you start to realize that you are not invincible, that you, you will die if you keep pushing too hard. And so, um, and you know, my friend Joel Sertori always tells me you can't take pictures when you're dead. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's my goal now is to stay alive and stay in the game and um, keep, keep doing what I'm doing. And, and sometimes I have to say no to dangerous situations. Are there other ways in which you found yourself cutting back in terms of staying away from some of the danger? Not really. I mean, I'm, you know, like, I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, you know, flying my ultralight airplane, I started to realize that after two airplane crashes and five engine failures uh, of trying to do something, you know, to flying is one thing, but trying to switch hands when you're in the cockpit, you take the doors off your little pusher ultralight and you got your camera and you're, you're trying to, you know, work with, you know, fly and shoot at the same time, low level over the trees near mountains to get a, a B-level photograph was not a smart use of time. I mean, I've done some really, now that you got me thinking about it, I've done some stupid stuff, like trying to get aerials in the Arctic before I bought my ultralight airplane to film narwhals. I hooked up a parasail that we had shipped through the mail that we had never opened before. We threw it out on the sea ice. I hooked it up to a snowmobile and told my buddy just to yank me off the ice. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm 400 feet up in the air behind a snowmobile with a parasail. And uh, the back of the snowmobile is coming up, so my buddy jumped on the back of the ran up, jumped on the back of the snowmobile to keep it down. Then a crack opened up in the ice, and there's a tailwind, and I fell the final hundred feet uh, when this when the parasail came down. I bounced off the ice, sort of ended up in this big slushy hole. My Inuit guy just stood over me, going, "Oh, laughing," because it was like a nervous laugh. He thought for sure I was dead. I was surprised I wasn't dead. And I mean, just stuff like that. I'm going to stop doing stupid stuff. I, I want to start eliminating stupid stuff and just cowboy decisions and just be a little more calculated and thoughtful. So when you go down in cold water, describe the feeling and why you vomit. I used to vomit. Now I work with a manufacturer called Waterproof Diving out of Sweden and I help them custom design some of their ice diving stuff so I no longer have the vomiting issue when I go down. But what, what's the difference? The difference is just wearing equipment that was so thin, designed for diving in British Columbia, thin hoods, thin neoprene. Um, just not properly fitting gear. You know, have you ever had an ice cream headache where you drink a slurp, you know, one of your Starbucks drinks too fast? You get that ice cream headache, except you get that over your entire head. And just for some reason with my body's reaction is just to start puking. But now I've wear enough equipment now, much better design hoods and stuff that that problem doesn't happen. But can you still not feel yourself when you're taking photos? Oh yeah, after I mean, you still have all those problems. So I mean, you go down, so I just don't vomit anymore, but you, within five minutes, you lose all feeling in your lips and your face and within, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, you lose all feeling in your extremities, your hands, your, your feet, everything gets extremely cold that that feeling goes away. 
after about half an hour to 40 minutes of diving in water that's 28, 29 degrees Fahrenheit, you start to shiver after 40 minutes. Your body's reaction is trying to warm you up. You're just cold almost to the point your teeth are chattering on your reg. You're just, uh, you know, and after about an hour of that, the shivering stops. You haven't felt your extremities for 40 minutes. Uh, your body's going into something that's it's like a blood shunting where it's keeping the blood to your heart, to your core, to your brain. It's removing it from your extremities, trying to keep you alive. And from there, you, um, you just, you, you know, at that point, when you start to cramp up, uh, the shivering stopped. If you're not getting out of the water by then, you're in trouble. And I've just, I've found myself pushing it to that point a few times. And that's another indicator now that I get out when the shivering starts. You know, I don't wait to the point where I'm cramped up and I can't move and you're, you're under the ice. If something happens, you're, you get a free-flowing regulator and all of a sudden you have to react, but you can't because you're, you're not thinking right, you're not feeling right, you're not working right, you're, your motor skills aren't there. So it's, it's just putting yourself in liability. Again, that just comes down to decision making. To what extent do you think when your time comes, it ends up being on a shoot? Yeah, I, I, I just somehow feel like I've all the 20 lives that I've burned up, I feel like, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't again say I'm invincible, but I'm to a point where I've reeled myself in a bit and um, I feel like I'm good to go. You know, I don't think it's gonna happen. I'm more scared being in a car on a highway. There are enough people in the world who are on, I've almost been hit by a semi when I'm riding my road bike, you know, on a highway, or I feel like my time, unfortunately, I just, I'm not scared of death. I just don't want to die in a car, you know, bleeding out with the jaws of life going and just because some drunk driver hit me or somebody was texting or, you know, I mean, if I die doing what I love doing, then, then so be it. You know, it's, it's the journey I'm on and there's urgency to the stories that I'm telling and, and death, the fear of death doesn't factor into my, into my world. But at the same time, I know that I need to stay alive if I'm going to keep telling these stories.